Because adversity is often the breeding ground for development. Dive into neurointerventional stories, the uncensored interviews. Our guests, all leaders in the field of neurointervention, share the difficulties they face, the complications they have had to manage, and speak without filters on little discussed, sometimes controversial, or simply taboo subjects. Hello, my name is Nantia Suji Jantararat, and today I am pleased to welcome Dr. Jens Fieler. Dr. Fieler, how are you today? I'm good, thank you. In a few words, can you briefly introduce yourself and your patents? Yes, my name is uh, Jens Fieler. I'm f uh, the director of the Department of Neuroradiology, both diagnostic and interventional, at Hamburg University Hospital, University Hospital Hamburg Eppendorf. I've heard multiple things about your career, but this podcast today, the theme is INR Stories, the Uncensored Interviews. So we're focusing on some of the difficulties and the complications that our interviews who are all leaders in the field, have had to face. And I thought that maybe just to give an overview of everything, we'll start with a general question. So what would you say is the most difficult professional difficulty that you've, you've had to face in your career thus far? That's a good question. So I think dealing with complications is emotionally the most challenging part. I don't want to go into details, but Specifically, when I was a, a young interventionalist, dealing with with complication I, it was very difficult for me. I was um, I was trying to find a way, and I think I found a way. And when growing older, you have the feeling that you have more net benefit <laughs> than than you had before. But specifically, early in career, I think this is where it makes or breaks you as an interventionalist. Would you mind sharing some tips and tricks of young interventionalists trying to make it through the same transition? I think what's underappreciated is really talking to the family, so talking to the patient, hopefully she, he is still alive, but also talking to the family, go directly to them and don't try to hide and to express what has happened and I think that's that's the most important part because more than once I experienced how they tried to comfort me even. So it was really kind and a very good experience because they felt it was a kind of superior force. It was not a bad doctor doing bad things, but it's it's a kind of destiny story that bonds us together. I think that's that's very important to, to go to the family straight away and talk to them. What is your personal style in terms of you know, I imagine because family discussion a lot of times also has to do with what was said before the surgery was done. How do you manage expectations in patients and families, especially when you know that you're going into a case that's perhaps hopeless or, or have very little chance of having good outcome? I think that's it's very difficult because I personally, I'm a very rational person. And I'm trying to present the evidence that we have. Mm -hmm. But in most cases, patients and their relatives, they just don't understand that there are limits to our knowledge. They always want to want us to, to be the superheroes who know everything, who can do everything. But that's not the case. And they often don't accept that we don't know whether this treatment is going to be beneficial or also on a scientific basis with, with numbers and so on. That's very difficult to, to convey. Even if we are trying to be very simplified with explaining statistics and with examples, I think the, the biggest message that I got from my teacher in neurointervention is every patient is afraid. Mm -hmm. And this blurs all the conversation that you are having. We are limited by the information that's available at the time in our field, and our field evolved so fast that sometimes the information we know today is not the same as, as months from now. <laughs> so it, it is difficult. We'll segue a little bit into that then. Almost everything in our field now is managed through, like we said, data-driven science, right? So what role does your institution, your feelings play in kind of deviating from the guideline in terms of when you coach the family and the patients through. It is sometimes kind of necessary to choose treatment outside of official guidelines. How would you manage personal risk in these cases? One of the key approaches is that you present the guidelines 
and the data as they are, as far as you can explain them. And then you make a complete shift and say, okay, this is how I wanted to be treated myself or my family. I think that's how I would make this shift. So kind of make it personal yeah. on a personal level. And so I think, I think it's, it really touches an interesting point. I'm very much interested in, in clinical study, data, guideline writing. I'm the senior author of two important European guidelines on stroke treatment. So I have some experience with this mm -hmm. field. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, it's important to know when to deviate. Mm -hmm. And this comes from experience. But at the same time, the older you get, the more you rely on your experience. And you, you are more frequently wrong than you are right. Because in the end gravitating towards the guideline is probably the best idea. Right. Especially for a young oh, um, interventionist, course. definitely, to have yes. something to fall back. But to. it must not be ironclad rule that you must not deviate. And this, I think this is where we still have some room for maneuvering as physicians, and we should use that uh, wisely. So previously, I've heard that you run a premier core lab in your country and maybe for the region. Would you mind talking to yeah. us a little bit about that and, and yeah. how you come to be in that position? Yeah, yeah. Uh, thank you uh, for bringing this up because a while ago in 2015, we founded this core lab. It's called AppData. It's a spin-off from the Hamburg University Hospital. And we are currently managing 36 studies in the neurointerventional field from an imaging core lab perspective. And we use everything we earn with this for developing specific software to make the process more reliable and more transparent for everybody. And the deeper you dive into the subject of image evaluation for study, there is no bottom. It's, it's always, you have always some cases where it's really difficult to say, is this X, Y, or Z? And I think it is very important to understand these granularities before you start talking about AI. So we, right from the beginning, we were very much interested in using AI for standardizing image evaluations. But first, you need to understand what the AI is going to do. Mm. Otherwise, it's doing something very consistently, but maybe not the right thing. It's highly precise, but the accuracy is very low. Mm. How do you foresee this being integrated in our field? I think we are currently in a hype phase <laughs> and we believe that everything is taken over. But there has been a famous editorial in the New England Journal in 2016 that radiology is the first discipline in medicine that is going to fall. It hasn't happened yet. Mm -hmm. And I, I think we need to learn to use it properly properly. And I think this is our main challenge, to learn as much as possible about how it works and to use it properly. Not to say, okay, we pray that we survive until the end of our time as a physician, until this thing takes over. I think we should spearhead this transition. Now, I also see here that you are an editor for JNIS for quite some time now, yes. right? Would you be able to talk a little bit about how you came to be in that position and what, what are the most difficult aspects of that? Yes. So I was trained for two years as a neurologist in, in the beginning of my career. And this is where I think got this whole scientific thinking studies and so on. And I love that and I cherish that all the time. And I'm really happy to see that our field, neurointervention, grew much more into this, mainly because of the thrombectomy studies. That, But there are many more studies now. And the quality of the papers has really increased. So the major challenge for now is really to find reviewers who are <laughs> responding and uh, are on time and to give their honest opinion. So I, I think this whole process of paper reviewing is far from perfect, mm -hmm. but so far nobody came up with the smarter idea. There are a few ideas out there, like, like maybe different people are reviewing different parts of a paper, doing a kind of crowd review and things like that. But I, I don't think it works. Yeah. It's still element of, of art in it. Yeah. So I, I, for the German Journal Clinical Neuroradiology, European Neuroradiology, I think I added more than 1,000 papers wow. or way more than that. And JNIS, I think, is, is, has a very high quality mm -hmm. is, and it's a highly respected journal and for a good reason. Yeah. I'm really happy and proud to be part of this. So maybe we'll shift gear a little bit and talk about some of the personal difficulties that you've had to overcome in the pursuit of your career. 
I must say, in retrospect, I don't think I encountered real difficulties. So I'm a village boy from East Germany, so I'm not from Hamburg originally. So at least to go into the big world was a challenge, but I always wanted to do that. And I think I rarely encountered fears, resistance or difficulties maybe because of my accent or something in the beginning, <laughs> but that, that was about it. So yeah. I think if you approach the world with curiosity and you say, okay, that's interesting, and you don't complain so much and you try to learn and to adapt, I think there's not much to complain, even, even now. <laughs> yeah. Was there anyone that inspired you into going into medicine and in this field in particular? Not into medicine, but for neurointervention, I had a lecture as a student when the neurosurgery professor explained that there is a microcatheter going from the brain into an aneurysm, and then they <laughs> put in coils that are as much worth as a little Mercedes at that time. And I thought, oh, that's so glamorous. I wanted yeah. to do that. That's funny. I feel like all these big transitions and big goals that all of us have had pretty much can be boiled down to one or two moments that just like kind of yes. light, light bulb in your head, right? 100%. All right, so <laughs> let's talk about collaboration with the industry. Having been the person who managed a neurointerventional core labs, I'm sure you've encountered a lot of industry sponsorship and management that you mm. have to do from that, that standpoint. To what extent can this collaboration help improve our field, our technique, and how do you manage the ethical component of that? I think, number one, industry is making possible what we are doing. They are producing the devices. Theoretically, we could sit somewhere in the basement and put them together ourselves, but uh, at a very lower standard and so on. This is what they are doing. And to keep doing, they need to earn money. And I don't think we should be too romantic about industry. But at the same time, I, I think in our field, it's relatively small Everybody knows everybody. Uh, so I, I think it, it's a very good connection. And I'm personally working with many, many companies, so I don't feel biased towards a specific company. And I think either you work with none of them or with all of them. Mm -hmm. This would be m my rule. But working with none of them, this is what some say, is then you are completely unbiased. And I think that's not true. Everybody has biases even then you have a non-industry bias and then you say that this is the wrong approach, but this is really not resonating with me at all. Yeah. Definitely heard that approach before. I think most of us have worked with industry to some extent. It's very hard not to in, a, in this field because it's so technologically yeah. driven. And ac actually, I think it's our obligation to work with industry yeah, to, to nudge them into a good direction. We cannot say you should do that because mm -hmm. we don't know the inner constraints and the financial planning and so on, mm -hmm. but we can give them the impression where the, the thing should go uh, on behalf. We, we are the advocates of our patients mm -hmm. to keep them working into a good direction and not just to have the nth iteration of something that doesn't bring much progress. All right, so we are nearing the end of this podcast. If you could go back 10 to 15 years, was there anything that you would do differently in your career? I can say not in the big things. Mm -hmm. Of course, if I, I knew 10, 15 years ago what I know now, I would have been smarter and quicker with many of my decisions. But I think that's really hard to do. So in retrospect, I'm quite okay with what I did. And I think the, the key decision where to work. I think this was a lucky punch from my side. I think this was the best single decision I took. Yeah. Having worked where you work today, you mean? Yes. I'm, I'm still there. I had a brilliant uh, teacher, Hermann Zäumer. Not many know him now, but he was actually the first who did intra-arterial stroke treatment in December 1981. Yeah. Oh. And in the 80s, he was quite famous but he was a very f modest person. He is still a very modest person, so that's why he's not walking around and is celebrated all the time. <laughs> <laughs> so you work for your mentor. That was your first job? Yes, oh, yes, wow. yes. What yes. was that like? It was, it was interesting because in the angio room, he was very emotional and kind of difficult, and not many wanted to assist him. 
And I thought, okay, I, t I take the challenge. And it was really difficult because he was asking for catheters that he actually didn't want because he didn't remember the right name. And I gave him the right one that he wanted. So it was a transition <laughs> act, but I learned so much. And he was a great human and physician. So I learned a lot from him about patients and how to deal with them. I really uh, appreciated this part. So if we fast forward 15 to, or 20 years, how do you imagine the field will evolve? I think if we look at world history in general, progress is going into the direction easier, more profitable, and safer. And I think these are the three major directions. And I think we will have most likely robotics playing a higher role, making people earlier successful with intervention, kind of democratizing this, this manual skills field and also supporting the interventionalist in the decision-making process and, and so on with simulating different scenarios. I, I think that's coming But I believe that the interventionalist will still be in, in the driving seat. And most likely we exaggerating the change from now to 15 years. Because looking back 15 years, okay, we had not the thrombectomy studies and so on. But, but in general, what we did, microcatheters and so on, it's, it's the same thing. Pretty much the same. Yeah. yeah. And I would be surprised if it would be a completely different world. Yeah. yeah. I'm with you on that. All right, two final questions that we ask everybody. So if we now turn our attention to the training of the new interventionalists coming out today, what do you think we don't do enough for them? Nothing. No. Yeah. <laughs> I think they yeah, are a, treated a, they okay. are treated uh, very well. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> We've certainly come a long way. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, we've discussed several difficult uh, questions right off the bat, so we'll, we'll end on a positive note. What initiative, advancement, technological innovation that has inspired you or make the most impression on you in the recent decades and why? I think in general, the thrombectomy trials, they made our field much bigger, much more standardized, much more scientific And it put us into the, the limelight also for industry investments. So it's a beneficial circle, virtuous circle that brought us to the next level. So I wouldn't say it impressed me, but it was, I think, the single most important thing that happened to this discipline. And we came from this old school single superhero with two or three people admiring him And he speaks the truth thing to this more data-driven study approach that I like much more, but it still needs this human element. And this is, I think, it's, it's, it's also something we need to teach how to deal with, with this. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Fehler, for your time today. My pleasure. Thank you for having me.